Hey, welcome to the first of what we hope will be you know, a fairly uh, regular forum on wine science. I'm Malcolm Thompson. I'm the uh, vice president with Nomacork, our sponsor here today. You know, we're really, really uh, excited by the turnout. You know, I think we had almost 300 people signed up um, before we had to cut it off. Uh, we're really fortunate. We've got uh, four great um, speakers, really talented academics that are going to talk on a variety of subjects relating to oxygen management. It's a lot of content I think you're going to find very interesting and very anxious to kind of get on with the show. But before I turn the floor over to them, I do want to provide you with a little bit of an introduction just to put things into context on kind of how we got here, you know, what do we hope to achieve from today's session, and in general, what we're trying to do with our whole oxygen management initiative, okay? Um, but before I do that, um, if it's okay, just a brief word from our sponsor, Nomacork. You know, we are a global leader in the supply of high performance, let's call them alternative uh, closures. Um, this year we're on, on the pace to, to sell almost 2.4 billion of those products. Um, you know, if you look at it from a U.S. perspective, we're really, we're really fortunate. We've really had enjoyed a, a tremendous business here. Um, and today, our market share stands about 40%, so we're selling almost 700 million closures into the U.S. alone. I know a lot of our customers are here. I recognize a lot of people. Uh, big shout out to you guys, and uh, thanks for coming, and uh, thanks for your business. You know, it's nice that we have an opportunity to get back a little bit um, with sessions like this. You know, all of our products are based on a proprietary process called uh, co-extrusion. And basically, it's a continuous process where we produce products that have a low density and very consistent foam inner core that's encapsulated with this specialty elastomeric material that really flexibilizes the outer skin. So together, those two features of our product uh, enable us to produce uh, products that provide very consistent wine preservation performance, while at the same time guarding against things like leakage, which, which uh, is apt to occur you know, during bottling, essentially. Um, we're headquartered in North Carolina, you know, as we joke, the center of the wine uh, industry. Um, you know, but from there we ship to virtually every major wine region across the globe. Uh, we do have our headquarters in, uh, our European headquarters based in, in Belgium, where we produce basically for Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, we have facilities established in China and most recently in Argentina, servicing the uh, domestic market there. Um, you know, we've embraced this whole subject of of oxygen management, and I think that's, uh, and that's clear to you, and, uh, you know, based on the fact we're hosting this session today. And I just want to provide you with a little bit of uh, history around that as to how we got into this, uh, this particular area. First, you know, kind of by the nature of co-extrusion, as I alluded to before, the fact it's a continuous process, it allows us to produce closures that have this very consistent foam structure. And that, in turn, enables us to control the oxygen transfer rate in a very consistent and a very specific way. You know, and we've, uh, we've known that for a while about our products, such that, you know, if you go back even to uh, as far back as 2004, we made this decision to kind of diversify our product offering. And we introduced a line of products that were unique in oxygen transfer rates, and each designed for specific wines that had unique preservation performance, or let's say oxidation resistance performance requirements. You know, and at that time, you know, our, our customers, primarily our customers, were asking us to provide data to, to kind of support um, our statements about, you know, wine preservation. So we did a lot of bottling trials. And basically the way that went is we would send out samples of these four different products, each having unique oxygen transfer rates for these bottling trials. We collect the bottles and then, you know, it's, it's sort of regular intervals, we would conduct some type of analytical characterization and then we'd have a sensory panel um, evaluate the wines from a sensory uh, perspective. And um, suffice to say, we got a lot of surprises. You know, things didn't always behave as we expected and some examples of that would be uh, perhaps some of our more premium, lower OTR closures where we thought that the wines would be developing in a more preferential manner Despite the fact we had four closures that were significantly different in oxygen transfer rate, we've seen absolutely no difference in SO2, 
in wine development. Um, so we knew there was more to the oxygen management story, let's say, than just the closure OTR itself. So, so based on that, we got interested. Um, and uh, we, we realized that there's a lot of things we didn't understand. So we, at that point, we made a decision to go deep. And uh, we initiated what became a really significant global uh, research activity focused on oxygen management, and specifically how oxygen ingressed through the closure in combination with a variety of other factors relating to winemaking influenced wine quality and, and uh, wine development in general. So that was about seven years ago. Uh, so it's gone on for quite some time. We, we've amassed a really significant um, amount of data. Uh, we've made some really interesting discoveries and what we think are some really important findings and some of those we're gonna share with you today. Uh, the research continues, by the way. It's less fundamental today and it's more focused on applied or practical where we're trying to, let's say, develop solutions to some of the issues that we've, we've surfaced. But uh, if you were to kind of make a couple of conclusions from all this work, we'd say, um, first and foremost, that oxygen management is important at er virtually every step in the winemaking process, not just closures. Um, and then secondly, and, and I don't want to say this in a way that I'm defending anybody, you know, but as a general rule, oxygen is out of control as it relates to winemaking. And, and I want to share some, some data that would support, you know, that kind of a, a statement. Okay, let's just start with uh, bottling and, and closures. You know, and this is a couple of simple charts, and I don't want to get into the specifics. It's just, just to give you an idea to support the statement I just made. But this, this first chart is, is really about uh, bottling. And, you know, over the years, we've done virtually hundreds of audits where we utilize our Nomasense uh, oxygen analyzer that Stefan is going to show um, later on today. And, uh, and basically, um, we use the analyzer to measure headspace and dissolved oxygen during bottling. Together, those things you know, result in what we call total package oxygen, or TPO. And that's a contribution of oxygen associated with bottling. It's not related to the closure specifically. It's just due to bottling. And you can see you know, that, uh, and this is just a sampling, that based on our experience, the variation in TPO during bottling is really significant. It can be as low as less than two or one PPM, which you could say, that's, that's ideal. That's really almost fully optimized. Or it can be as high as almost 10. And in some cases, we've even seen greater than 10 PPM. To put that into a little more perspective, let's take a product we sell called Classic Plus. I think last year we sold about 600 million of those in the US. So it's a standard of sorts. Um, if you look at the auction transfer rate of Classic Plus, you know, in essence, about two PPM per year, a little more, but roughly two PPM per year permeates through that closure. So in other words, for every two PPM that you pick up during bottling, in essence, you lose one year wine preservation. So you can think about when you have a wine that is bottled and you're picking up upwards of 10 PPM, which is five or six years of wine preservation, um, it's a really substantial effect and it overshadows the closure performance, particularly if these wines are, let's say, relatively quick turn, which is not uncommon for the US. So they're consumed you know, in one or two years, certainly. Um, I note the closure types here, and, and maybe it's not having that profound effect on, on the TPO itself. But when you take this TPO variation and you couple it with the variation in closure OTR, and this just gives you an idea, particularly relating to natural cork and natural cork base products, which are naturally um, inconsistent. So variation in OTR in combination with variation in, in bottling TPO can have a very profound effect on wine consistency and wine quality. As I think is, is kind of evidenced by this, this chart, this noisy chart, and I'll try to explain it. And um, actually we borrowed this from um, a, a feature that was published last year by Jamie Goods in uh, wines and vines, and I'll, I'll explain it to you. Basically, across the bottom here, we have you know, um, 30 different wines, actually top-selling wines in the US, so, and 10 from each of three wine quality brackets. So less than $5, 5 to 10, and greater than 10. Okay, and for each wine, 18 uh, bottles were purchased in the San Francisco area 
at various retail establishments. You know, and it was San Francisco was picked um, to eliminate the effect of storage and handling issues. So certainly these results would probably be even more variable if you pick bottles up in the Northeast or Southeast or Texas or whatever. So we wanted to, they wanted to eliminate that effect and just focus really on what's happening at the winery. And, uh, and basically you have a plot of free SO2. That's all I've shown here. They've done additional analytical work and sensory work, which is also pretty interesting. But you can see from these values that in the variation, even considering free SO2 testing, and you might say that the uh, variance on a test like that is 3 ppm, give or take. So you are going to get some natural variance associated with the test. But basically, from a statistical perspective, many of these wines would be regarded out of spec or out of control. Some of them below the, the danger zone, if you will, or danger line at 10 ppm, which is kind of commonly accepted as, um, let's say, the uh, below which you know, you're apt to see some hints of oxidation, particularly with white wines, or very high, where you might pick up you know, SO2 uh, sensory attributes, which are not so pleasant either. But a lot of these wines are definitely going to show inconsistency in terms of the manner by which they've developed. I think it's really interesting work. It's very basic work, and we intend to do a lot more of this kind of stuff to, to benchmark, let's say, um, oxygen management uh, uh, from a real practical perspective. OK, um, so let's just look at, you know, that was kind of consistency. But if you look at wine faults, and I know some of you that have seen these talks before are getting sick of me showing the London Wine Challenge data. But it's just special in the sense that it's the largest uh, wine uh, competition in the world. There's 14,000 bottles that are submitted every year. Uh, and there's two panels there. There's one that's an expert tasting panel, and the other is an expert fault evaluation panel. So what happens is a bottle's brought to a taster. They taste it. If it's faulty, then typically they send that away. It's disposed of. They bring them another one. Uh, in the case of the London Wine uh, Challenge, they bring that bottle suspected as being faulty to a fault uh, specialist table, they assess the nature of the fault. You know, and they, they categorize it as either being corked or oxidized, reduced, et cetera, et cetera. OK, they've been doing that really since 2006 now. So they've got a pretty rich database of, uh, of uh, fault statistics. You know, And just to, to point out that uh, on average, over those five years, roughly 6.5% six, six um, of all wines submitted were deemed to be faulty, which is I guess not shocking, although in some respects it is shocking. Um, of that, you know, cork tin is alive and well, sitting at just under 2%. Now, I just want to point out here that that's 2% of all wines submitted. And this is London. And London has largely gone screw caps. Um, so that's, you know, 2% um, when only roughly 50% of the wines are under cork. So you would say that the actual cork tin rate, based on bottles closed with cork is something uh, just north of 3%. Um, but really, the purpose of this slide is to point out the oxygen management-related faults. And always, we see oxygen management issues account for a majority of the total faults. And uh, they don't receive the same level of attention as other faults like, like cork tank. I point out here, reduced is uh, something interesting. And uh, um, that's on the rise in London associated with screw cap use. And the same rule applies here. As with natural cork, you know, roughly 45%, I think, of the wines were under screw cap. Um, so the amount of wines that were showing uh, emulating signs of reduction were over 3% and in the same kind of range as, uh, as cork tank. Um, OK, so that's, that's the London Wine Show. I had some additional data here that maybe you haven't seen. This is from the San Francisco Wine Chronicle competition a couple of years ago. We tried to do what is done at the London Wine Show. We hired a specialist, master of wine, came in, set up a fault uh, evaluation panel. And we basically did the same thing. And this is what we got. OK, in this case, fault levels are only 2.4% total. Um, and I think that's due to a couple of reasons. First, I think generally it could be said that the quality of closures used in the US is higher than the rest of the world. I, I think we've seen that, you know, that they use good quality closures here, generally speaking. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that, and this is awards, these are wine, wines that won awards at this competition. Um, however, 80% of the wines submitted won an award. So it represents the majority of the population, if you will. And you can see that wines here are, are heavily skewed to premium and fine wine categories. You know, over $10 a bottle, where 
in real life, a vast majority of the wines consumed in the US are really in this four to $10 range. So you might say that these statistics are best case, and they're really dealing with really fine, fine quality wines. Uh, but again, you can see, okay, you know, TCA and Woody, I guess. Uh, um, but you know, really the point here is that oxidation and reduction, um, you could even say SO2 and micro to a certain extent are oxygen management related, but again are accounting for almost 50% of the total faults that are occurring. And even though that number is lower, I still think we should regard that as unacceptable. That's still a very high fault level. I think a lot more work needs to be done in this area, and, and we have an intention to do that. Uh, but the early indications are that, yeah, you know, they can. They can. And I'll just show, you know, kind of um, one set of data. And it's just interesting the way they did the study. So, but this is from AWRI, and it was published a couple years ago. Basically, they took 14 red wines. These are not all Australian red wines. They're from around the world. Um, and basically, they had an um, a expert sensory panel characterize them. And then they went out and they had uh, 216 consumers from Australia, all walks of life. I mean, let's say novice wine drinkers to expert wine drinkers and everything in between. Um, taste them and just rank their preference. Which did they prefer? And then they just concentrated um, that, that data and note each one of these dots is a particular wine. Um, and you see that this, this, these circles here, that's the concentration of preference. And the only thing I want to point out here is these two circles. You know, bruised fruit, barnyard, burnt rubber, vegetal. Generally speaking, these are indicators often used to describe either oxidation or reduction. So basically, wines that were emulating signs of oxidation or reduction were considered least preferred by um, Australian consumers by this study. Now, that's interesting itself, recognizing 90% of the Australian markets in screw caps now. So Generally speaking, uh, reduction is, you know, is, is a pretty significant factor there. Uh, but, but what's really interesting, I think, is that they, they went to China and they did the same thing. Basically the same 14 red wines, this time 310 um, consumers. You could say probably not nearly as astute as far as wine um, you know, uh, tasting is, is concerned as the Australians. But still, you know, the same kind of process where they were asked to rank in terms of preference, and this chart and this sphere of preference is virtually identical to the results that uh, were generated by the Australian consumers. And once again, if you look in this area, you know, bruised fruit, um, you know, earthy or vegetal, basically indicators that, that are typically used to describe oxidation and reduction. So even in China, where you could say that um, that the level of knowledge with respect to, uh, to, to the wine quality is really at its infancy. And I'm certain that a majority of these people couldn't tell you what cork taint was, couldn't tell you what oxidation was, and I've experienced it myself. Um, but when you give them an option, when you give them wines that aren't faulty, and you have them taste those versus wines that are, and wines that are showing signs of oxidation reduction, they prefer wines that aren't faulty. I mean, expressed that way, it's kind of obvious, but... Um, but uh, anyway, I just think it's, a, it's an interesting work and, yeah, much to do in this particular area. So, um, so that's really it. You know, it's just an indication of why we think this subject is really a valid subject, why we think it's important. Um, you know, what we're trying to do to, here today is really, okay, first and foremost, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of research, we've got a lot of findings, we want to share a lot of that uh, with you, and we want to, you know, take a step forward and start to propose what we consider to be some potentially practical solutions to addressing some of the problems that we've identified. You know? And as I mentioned, you know, we know that oxygen ingress is, is a factor and it's important at every step in the winemaking process, whether it's with must or, you know, or uh, maturation or with bottling and, uh, and closure selection. You know? and, uh, and maybe in an ideal world, it should look something like this, where you know, when a wine is, let's say, best able to defend against oxidation. Yeah, that's when it sees the greatest amount of oxygen. You know, as Steph would like to call it, this is really macro, micro, nano, in terms of oxygen, con uh, in ter in terms of oxygen ingress during this process. Um, but, you know, and um, this is more like we see. <laughs> it's, it's not scientific, so this is uh, just, uh, you know. Um, but really, it's, it's all over the map, that, that's for sure. 
And, uh, and you could say that, okay, must preparation and maturation, whether it's barrel aging and barrels breathe, or whether it's micro-oxygenation where you're bubbling oxygen into, into a tank, um, you know, you can blend away some of those problems afterwards, right, through tasting and blending practices to make things more consistent. But once you hit here at bottling, you know, at a time when your wine is most susceptible to, let's say, oxidation, things like oxidation, uh, you don't want to have this, you know, which is a big shot of oxygen on your bottling line, and you certainly don't want to have closures that are operating in a very inconsistent fashion because that's going to carry through into the bottle, and that's what your customers are going to experience when they taste the wine. Um, so that's it in terms of my introduction. Um, as I mentioned, we're really, really fortunate to have uh, four great um, speakers here today. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on their bios. I think you have the agendas in hand, and uh, there's more detail there, but each are equally impressive, I would say. I just want to walk you through the program for today, you know, starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Maurizio Ugliano, who uh, we're uh, very fortunate to have with us at Nomacork. He's our uh, onological research manager based out of Nîmes. That's where our f research facility is based, basically. So, so um, Maurizio is, interface, is our principal interface with our research partners and is really leading that uh, research um, activity and joined us from AWRI almost three years ago, you know, where he was driving our research program at AWRI. Actually, there's a common thread through all these people. They all sort of came from AWRI, and, except for Dr. Waterhouse, and three of them have got their postdocs from AWRI, so I don't think AWRI likes us very much. Um, anyway, Maurizio is going to talk about oxygen and its influence on aroma development. Next, we have <laughs> professor, Dr. Andrew uh, Waterhouse, uh, who's, the, who's a professor at, uh, at certainly at UC Davis and probably most, if not all of you, um, know Andrew. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's been very active in, in the wine industry and particularly in California um, and, um, and was the, let's say, primarily responsible for the very significant research program that we did with UC Davis starting back in I want to say 2006. So I've been working with Andrew and UC Davis for a long time on this subject. And, um, and Andrew's going to talk about oxidation in general, get into some mechanisms and some nice chemistry, um, and uh, you know, and explore a little bit uh, you know, the whole issue of, of, of SO2 and the relationship with oxygen. I think it's pretty interesting. OK, we're going to take a break at that point, uh, about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll come back. I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Professor James Kennedy, um, who's with uh, Fresno State University, is actually chairing the Department of Viticulture and Enology there, and uh, um, James is a great guy, you know, and, and has really embraced the subject of oxygen management, and a lot of that relates to the, the research that he's been intimately involved in uh, associated with phenolics and tannin and color development. Um, and then... Um, you know, today, I'm sorry, James is going to be talking about the influence of oxygen on phenol development as it relates to tan and color. And then last and probably least, <laughs> he doesn't look nearly as good as this, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> just joking, just joking. Uh, Dr. Stefan Videl, he's our uh, global director of Enology, and of course he's based in, uh, um, at our uh, research facility in uh, Nîmes, France as well, and he's basically responsible for directing our overall oxygen management uh, program. Steph, I think you joined us um, almost six years ago, and, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, Steph joined us from uh, the Interone in Institute where he was responsible for overseeing their uh, lab management business, but prior to that was with um, AWRI and in Rhine in France. So, so we have four great speakers, um, and uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to them right now. So um, with that, uh, thank you very much. I just want to say that, uh, you know, we're going to allow a little more than a half an hour per speaker. We're going to try to keep questions to the end. Otherwise, we're going to run long, no doubt about it. We may run long anyway. Um, so we are going to leave a little bit of time at the end if you have any questions. So I ask you to kind of hold them. Uh, until then. I hope that you can stay around after the session. We're going to have a really interesting uh, wine tasting, you know, outside uh, where you, you get a chance to really see how, you know, closures and oxygen management um, come into practice and how they, they influence wine development. So I think it's an interesting 
exercise, if you can stay for that, that's great. Okay, thank you. So I'll turn the floor over to Maurizio Ugliano.